So welcome back to the Neurosymbolic Channel. So today we have some exciting news. Uh, our new book, Neurosymbolic Reasoning and Learning, is currently available for pre-order. Now let me just show you what that looks like. Here it is on the Springer website. Um, and it you know should come out probably sometime late August, early September. It's also available for pre-order on Amazon.com. So you might be wondering, you know, what's this all about? What's in the book? And so that was really my intention with today's video. So let me open up a PDF. So here we go. Uh, so I want to thank my co-authors, you know, Gerard or Samari, uh, who him and I have been working together for over a decade now. Chitta Baral, uh, you know, probably, you know, one of the more famous guys in AI here at ASU, as well as students of uh, Buwan and Lahari. So also want to thank my uh, PhD advisor, Via Subramanian, for writing a foreword here. And one thing I want to really stress uh, that he makes a really nice point about is this idea of linking optimization and logic is more than three decades old. And the use of neural networks and programming languages has been studied on and off. Uh, you know, this really was kind of a neat point because I know going back to the 80s with things like Nielsen logic, uh, the idea to solve consistency and entailment pro problems meant converting the logic program into a linear program and then solving that. Uh, so you have this nice link between optimization and, and logic. I also know there's been some work in, in the 90s of doing things like um, creating neural networks that uh, fully mimic the uh, syntax of a programming language such as uh, Pascal. And, you know, it just makes me think that these ideas in neurosymbolic AI uh, are really building on a foundation of years and years of work. This is something that just in the last couple of years, people finally thought, hey, let's combine, you know, uh, you know, neural nets with logic. It's it's been an ongoing concern. And I think that's that's really important to remember. If you look at our video of Louis Lamb, uh, he does talk about uh, some of this prior work, you know, how it's led to where we are today as well. Now, we wanted this book to be self-contained, so we uh, created a, a brief introduction to logic, focused on both propositional logic and predicate calculus. So if you look through this, we got plenty of nice examples. Um, we uh, also show uh, a very simple fixed point operator for doing uh, entailment. Um, and then with predicate calculus, we you know, link the idea of uh, constants with nodes in the graph, which is kind of a nice way to do it. And, you know, you see this kind of thing in knowledge graphs all the time. And then we, we build on that further in the next chapter where we go over fuzzy and annotated logic. And, and really, uh, this is what's at the core of uh, a lot of the differentiable logics that are used in neural symbolic systems. And so if you look at what we uh, put here, go back there. Uh, you know, first we talk about, um, you know, this idea of generalized annotated logic, which is kind of this general framework. It, it generalizes the fuzzy logics, uh, allows you to have arbitrary functions to um, specify the operators and you can mix and match as you please. Uh, yet still maintain some nice mathematical properties due to the underlying lattice structure representing the uh, uh, what are called the annotations, which is what is being used in place of truth values. And you see a diagram of such a lattice here where intervals are used. Now, those of you who are familiar with things like logical neural networks know that, hey, intervals are used in logical neural networks of to communicate the truth value. And, um, you know, here we see that we have a general, uh, a generalization of this concept. That's, that's kind of a nice, nice thing to have. Uh, we then get into, 
you know, further stuff with the syntax and semantics of generalized annotated programs. Um, and then we transition into fuzzy logic, where fuzzy logic is essentially thinking of, hey, where do these functions that represent the behavior of the operators come from? And so with fuzzy logic, let's go back down through. Uh, there are, you know, a whole lot of, you know, very common uh, things called T norms for conjunction and co T norms that are used for disjunction. And we try to list out, you know, the most frequently used ones uh, in, in various differentiable logics such as LTN and logical neural networks. And we, we show them here. And then as it progresses, um, we bring these up again and show how they are instantiated uh, with regard to a specific framework. And so, um, you know, there's there's been a lot of really nice papers in the last couple of years about this. And our goal was to try to, in this chapter, was to create a primer focused on, uh, you know, differentiable logics that underlie a lot of, of this new work. Then we go into logical tensor networks, which is probably one of the most well-known differentiable logic uh, frameworks out there. And in particular, it's used in cases where you want to combine a perceptual layer uh, with a logical layer to sort of loosely enforce uh, a set of logical constraints. And so we go over a lot of the basics here, uh, in particular, what is called grounding uh, in this case. And those of you who really know a lot about logic, you might hear the word grounding and think about, oh, well, we're grounding, uh, um, you know, a, a first order statement that is variables to be a set of statements that have constants. Uh, however, in the context we get to neural symbolic, a lot of times the word grounding gets used to refer to symbol grounding, which is the conversion of lower level symbols from the perceptual layer into logical constructs that can then be used for reasoning. And so we go through, you know, uh, you know, various aspects of LTNs. Um, we give some examples about formulas that can be represented. And, you know, now we start talking about uh, the fuzzy operators. Again, here we're bringing up uh, the aggregators that are used for uh, as fuzzy versions of universal and existential quantification. And then we talk a bit about tasks and use cases. Um, and then uh, a bit of a discussion on some of the experiments that have been conducted with LTN, such as clustering. Um, we follow this up with an alternative framework, uh, the uh, recurrent reasoning networks in what is used for, uh, you know, a, a paper on deep ontological networks and, and related stuff. And here we look to focus on approaches where the logic is not directly represented um, in traditional logic statements during reasoning, but logic is used as inputs and outputs to and from a neural model that simulates the deduction process, in particular uh, when you have cases where deduction uh, becomes intractable. And this is kind of a different use of the neural component. It's now being used as a uh, approximation heuristic for these you know, logics where uh, deduction becomes very difficult. And so this is a bit different way of looking at it. So we go over this architecture um, uh, that is used here, and, and that's kind of the idea behind that chapter. And then we go into uh, logical neural networks. This was a paradigm made popular by IBM, where it originated from. And, you know, kind of the, you know, some of the main themes here is uh, you know, the maintenance of uh, classical inputs and outputs as they define them, the use of intervals instead of scalar values, and, uh, you know, how this logic inherently allows for open world reasoning. So a lot of the nice things 
that we talk about in generalized annotated programs show up again here. Um, it's also, uh, you know, one thing to note is that logic tensor networks um, are also generalized by generalized annotated, or the logic with it at least is generalized by generalized annotated programs as well. It can capture uh, uh, the logic of both, although uh, that stuff described in the earlier chapter doesn't have a neural component. Um, so anyway, with logical neural networks, um, you know, we talk about uh, what the truth tables look like because there's this parameter alpha that's sort of like your threshold for truth and, you know, what the input and output thresholds should be. And kind of the idea with LMNs is uh, you want to get all your uh, fuzzy operators that are actually parameterized to conform uh, to this kind of truth table that you see here with the, uh, with the intervals based on some value alpha. And so we discuss how they do that. We go over uh, the operators and some of the properties, uh, show some examples on, on the network structure, uh, talk about you know, how these things are trained and the behavior uh, of the activation functions with respect to the fuzzy operators. They wrap the operators in the activation function, this framework. Uh, and then we, you know, do some discussion here and we talk about the pros and cons of this. Um, one thing that we noticed in doing the lit review and, you know, uh, maybe there's been more recent work on this, but we haven't really seen very much that integrates um, LNNs with a convolutional neural net, which is different from some of the other paradigms in the book, such as, uh, you know, LTNs or NER ASP. So, and speaking of NeurASP, that's the next chapter. Uh, NeurASP is a bit different um, than things like LTN or LNN because here you're not uh, you're not directly um, pushing the gradient through a fuzzy logic, but rather um, you are looking at kind of a uh, a PDF over the set of initial facts that would go through um, a logical layer that's put on top of a network. And the result is it makes uh, this more challenging from a scalability perspective. But, um, you know, ASP is a really popular logic. Um, also, you know, this whole notion of, uh, uh, how do you say, of, of not having to push a gradient uh, directly through the logic is, is a bit different from other approaches. And, and we see it starting to gain some traction. So anyway, we go over, we have some basics about answer set programming. And then we talk about, um, you know, the semantics of NeurASP and the special neural predicates, uh, as well as uh, how inference is done. Uh, we sh and we show some examples here. Uh, you know, I think with uh, Sudoku. And oh yeah, actually one nice thing about this chapter in particular is we got a lot of um, Klingo code, uh, which is a common ASP um, uh, uh, interpreter. And also there's an online supplement that goes with this at uh, neurosymbolic.asu.edu that has even more examples for this and other chapters. So then we kind of shift gears in chapter eight and we get into inductive logic programming, uh, specifically focus on differentiable inductive logic programming, which was this, this uh, famous paper by Evans and Gerpenstedt from uh, 2018. And so we go over that paradigm. We talk about how, um, you know, how they use a neural network to actually learn logical rules from data in an inductive logic program uh, style setup. So we, and that's all based on this thing called ILP as an instance of SAT solving, where you have these additional helper um, propositions, which is what this FI is here, that get tacked on and they're turned on and off based on uh, the results of how the, the neural network fits the data and then use that to uh, get the logical sentences out of the thing uh, after uh, after the learning is conducted. So we go through all that. We talk about um, 
you know, the architecture and here's the architectural diagram that we came up with. Uh, we also look at the complexity issues, uh, you know, that are inherent with this. So differential IOP is, is not scalable as it stands. Uh, there has been some more recent work that look at various subsets of this uh, that, that does because some of these, uh, you know, contributors to complexity become fixed in when you take a subset of this. Uh, then we look at another uh, rather famous paper called SatNet, which is about constraint learning. And we felt that this was important to include because SatNet is, um, and the follow-on work is a really good example of, you know, learning uh, logical constraints um, that can be used to actually solve a combinatorial problem, even though you can't really get at the logical constraints from the framework is still doing this symbolic reasoning. And also this is important due to the, um, you know, things about simple grounding that were both proposed and found to be uh, somewhat flawed due to label leakage. Let me go over that here. I think I have a little diagram where we talk about the label leakage problem. Yeah, here it is, where you didn't mask the output, you were indirectly supervising uh, the, input MNIST digits with the ground truth. And then we talk about how subsequent work actually masked that in the ground truth uh, during training. We then transition into neurosymbolic AI for sequential decision-making and look at, uh, you know, a series of papers here. Uh, you know, the first one being is a uh, deep symbolic policy learning, which is a really interesting framework. Here, uh, you're using reinforcement learning combined with RNNs to learn, um, you know, basically control theory style policies for uh, an agent. So you get this nice, you know, symbolic uh, policy here in the form of mathematical equations than the example seen on the screen to control the lunar lander. Um, and then, you know, so we go through all of that, uh, both how they, you know, do, uh, uh, you know, symbolic regression, and then how that is used as a building block for deep symbolic regression. And then we transition to something called STLNet, which was a NURBS paper from about two years ago that uses uh, the STL signal temporal logic uh, as means to verify RNN and transformer architecture. And they do this with this parent teacher paradigm. Uh, we all post videos channel on this as well. And then finally, we have a nice chapter about applications. And here we look at things like visual uh, question answering, you know, mainly, you know, the line of research is done kind of clever. Um, we also look at uh, the intersection between uh, natural language processing and neurosymbolic uh, reasoning as well. So we have a bit about that. Um, and, and some of this is also dealing with the ASP work. So additionally, um, let me also bring up one more thing. And if you go to our neurosymbolic.asu.edu homepage, and you click on neurosymbolic reasoning and learning. Uh, this is, you know, here's links to where you can order. Here's actually the, the cover of the book. It's kind of cool. Uh, and we also have links to some of the videos from this channel that are associated with the chapters. Some of these we have uh, slides for, but we also have um, supplementary material for select chapters. So for logical neural networks, you click on the supplement to chapter six, and we have some more information about logical neural networks right there. And then also with, uh, you know, as I was mentioning, the neuro ASP chapter, click on that. And here's some more Klingo code uh, with some more examples. Uh, so, you know, we tried to make this a really, rich experience to support, you know, getting into uh, this very exciting area. So uh, that's it for today. Thanks again for tuning in and please stay tuned for more content. Take care.